Um, so we're getting the afternoon going here, and Kathy wants us to thank Keo because he made a refurb the Ground Zero Center sign. It's a real gift to have Kyo. We're both Aleuts or Nungan. Uh, we're the people who inhabited the Aleutian chain from basically the peninsula all the way out to the very end. Uh, roughly 10% of our people exist at this point, so when two of us get together, it's kind of a big well, deal. I think before America brought Russia, we were occupied for what, 125, 150 years. Yeah. So they just moved up the chain. My family came from Atu originally, and he's from Adak, Unalaska. But the migration through that chain, they decimated all the tribes. Because there's, what, 80 islands, I think? Yeah. Yeah, there's over 80 islands in the Aleutian chain. So they just moved up the chain and they enslaved us. Um, they cut out our tongues so we wouldn't be able to speak the language. They gave us the diseases that wiped out our population to nearly, what, 3,000, I think, at one time. And now we might be 1,700. You know, it's interesting. And then... During the World War II, the internment camps, all the other tribes were pushed out into uh, the so-called internment camps. They were old fishery canneries throughout the Alaska chain. And my family ended up in Woody Island in one of the concentration, well, in yeah. internment camps, right? No food, no water, basic nothing. And uh, that's when my mom was maybe three, three years old when my grandfather rescued her. He was, he survived Pearl Harbor, the bombing in Pearl Harbor. And then he was transferred up to the Aleutian Island chain where he met my family in the Woody Island at the internment camps. And, you know, our family, we split. He's, you're yellow Russian, right? Yeah. And I'm white Russian. So both of the tribes split. They went to the islands and we went to Kodiak side. So I'm part of the Kodiak Native Corporation and you're the Alu. Uh, the Alu Corp and the Unalaska Corp. Yeah. So it's it's so amazing that Sean and I ran into each other here because there's so few of us. And that's the joke. I'm just an illusion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question? In the light of diminishing numbers, <coughs> is anyone, uh, pro you know, making proper histories? We're trying, but it's there's no proper history. It's dead. All it's our gone. elders are gone. Yeah. And still has to be records of some sort. No. There's not. Well, we can write down what you just said. Those things you know. But the actual history, who we were as a people, it's gone. Yeah. And that's what matters. The language is gone, the history is gone, the story is gone. Our traditions are gone, and they're trying to bring it back, but it's, you know, there's no, there's so few of us in the Aleutian yeah. Islands, and people think you're an island and it looks like Bainbridge. <laughs> the Aleutian Islands is rock, more rock, bushes, no trees. Here, every time I go out, I'm like, trees, yeah. <laughs> the trees are so big, right? Yeah. And I mean, for us, my tribe is calling, and it means people of the seal, and the seals are dying. Climate change is going to kill the seals off, and when they're gone, there's no... How, how do I exist when the food source I'm named after is extinct? Yeah. So... Yeah, because our heritage was uh, substance, sustenance? Sustenance. English is not my first language, so... <laughs> so... Uh, Joanne had an announcement. Who else had announcements? Raise your hand. Uh, okay. Carolee, Kathy. And don't forget to use the port potties. <laughs> yeah. You know, could I, could I suggest, well, I visited UNESCO in Paris, and they have a series of the histories of the world written by the peoples whose history has never been written down. It might be worthwhile to, to contact UNESCO, and they might be able to help with documenting your stories. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they have all these books now that are written, but they're in that whole process of trying to record the history that wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but that's that's not. I just wanted to. Well, we're we're still. I uh, okay down here. Yeah. Okay. Um. While well, well, we still have a little bit of nuclear weapons on our mind, I wanted to share with you. I'm, I'm I, I keep on getting involved in these Zoom meetings. 
uh, and one Zoom meeting was a strategic planning meeting. And as it turns out, it is it was a meeting that pulled together all the important names in nuclear weapons ab abolition across the world. And it was this amazing meeting because they were trying to strategize how can we keep nuclear weapons on the agenda and get this movement that we need to, for people to respond. So one of the things that came up was an effort to focus, not in the past, but in the future, because September 26, at the UN is the International Day for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. So one of the suggestions is they could get a global effort. Every country in the world, be it nuclear or non-nuclear, to stress the importance of that day, that could be one effort. So I wanted to share that with you, because if your own constituency group well, friends, family, whatever, if you could raise the issue and help make it part of what happens here in Washington State, that would be wonderful. Along with that, because they had all these you know, organizers in this meeting, they kept on thinking if they could come up with like a little pithy phrase to popularize that. Something like, you know, um, the phrases that we had with the nuclear freeze. Short, sweet, and effective. So they're working on that next step to come up with you know, either a slogan or something that would fit that day. And that would be the thing that we would try to get everybody to learn and say and get the t-shirts out and you know, spread, the, spread the word. That was one thing. A second Zoom meeting was one that was organized with Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. And they had a speaker on and there was a, there was a Russian professor, and I think his name was something like Verinsky, but he also lived part of his life in the Ukraine. So this was a professor who was obviously a, a humanist, obviously believing in nonviolence, and they said, what message do you have about the Ukrainian war? He said, it's very simple, ceasefire. Ceasefire. Don't worry about negotiations, don't worry about diplomacy yet, insist on a ceasefire. Because he said, the killing will stop. I mean, there's such incredible killing that is still going on. That if you focus on the ceasefire for Ukraine, just like we were trying to focus on the ceasefire, you know, for Israel and Gaza. But that was his big push. So I just wanted to share those with you, if you could kind of help move these ideas along, because they're very constructive and I think they're positive. There's a subtle thing that Americans play. It's a racist thing. The Chimicum tribe is not federally recognized. Yet the Chimicum tribe has a historical territory that goes back 10,000 years, a common language that goes 10,000 years back, and a culture that goes 10,000 years back. We existed, she existed, her people existed for 9,800 years before there was a little constitution that said she needed to be federally recognized. Don't play that game. She is who she is. She says who she is. And she's from an advanced society that managed to make this place productive and nonviolent without a big military base. So I think we should all listen to what she has to say. Hello. <laughs> well, what a beautiful day. Um, I'm happy to be here and get to speak to everybody and listen to other people and have these conversations in our community. It's very important. Um, it's very important to get together and talk about these hard things that a lot of people don't want to talk about. I wish there were more children here because they should be included in community and learning and understanding what's happening in their surroundings or in their world. And... Um, I'm an indigenous mother. Oh, my son's up there giving me thumbs up. Thank you, Hakuno. Um, I have seven children. Um, uh, there aren't very many uh, indigenous people left. Um, I definitely wanted to have many children. Um, the thought of our people no longer being in existence is like too hard to even speak. And you know that's happening 
not just to indigenous people all over the planet, and it's really hard to see it happening. It's hard to see the mothers um, in Palestine right now and the children. Um, it really hurts my soul as a mother to just know that these families are struggling so hard and to lose your child and not to be able to feed your child. I'm very into learning um, traditional foods and to plant traditional plants and to know and learn these things again that were, like Sean said, lost. Um, we weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't allowed to have our songs and dance, our sacredness, our religion. Um, I plan on changing that. I'm, I waited a long time. I talked about things. I had children. I got started getting closer to 50, and I thought, you know, do it. If, if I'm not seeing it done in community, I guess I'm going to have to be the one to make it happen. And sometimes you have to be that person. If you want to see it done, you want to see changes, get out there, start talking, make the changes you want to see in community because, you know, it might not happen if you're not the one out there doing it. Um, I'm trying to learn two different um, languages. I'm trying to teach my children words and um, foods and uh, that's very important. And knowing what foods um, you have wherever you are on the planet will definitely help you uh, in times of crisis when you could go out and you can gather and know what plants are edible, know what medicine is in your you know, area and territory. It's, it's very important and it could be life-saving. Um, indigenous people um, knew what plants they could eat. They did aquaculture. They had... Um, oyster beds and clam beds, and they, they knew these things, and they lived at one with the land, and that's why you don't see a trace of us anymore. Not just, a, you know, our, log, our long houses and our homes were burnt, um, but even if they weren't burnt, they would have become one with the earth again. Um, it's very important to um, be close with your environment, um, know how your environment can help you in times of need. I think that with climate change and everything happening, I'm seeing my world change just in my lifetime with less bugs, less, you know, it's getting very hot. It's, things are changing. Hi, Hawk, I love you. Yeah. Getting lots of support. <laughs> but including your children, too. Children are very smart and understanding and I'm not saying traumatize them with, you know, certain facts that are hard for smaller children to understand, but having open conversations and include them, um, it's very important. And to, to just talk about what peaceful ways we can make these changes in the world. We can start in community. We can start, you know, in, in your family. It starts in your family. It starts with open conversations with gardening, with teaching them plants, animals, language, um, all sorts of things. Um, that's what's important with me anyways, uh, learning what I can and teaching what I can to the children. Um, I really wanted to see, um, have a space for my people in our community and so I started Longhouse for the People Project with some friends. Uh, my friend Jess really gave me the push to like, just do it, just put it out there and go. Uh, and I'm thankful she did because here I am. Um, we fundraised, we have almost 12 acres for our Longhouse Project. Um, we uh, purchased land, we cleaned land, we bought a mill with our friend and neighbor. We've been milling cedar. We've gotten lots of cedar donations, um, lots of work parties and allies, and it's been wonderful. Um, we've planted a small prairie, Camas prairie or koala, um, with other uh, prairie plants, um, and have different first foods gardens on the land. And eventually, we plan on cutting trails into this. Uh, 12 acres to um, see a lot of these plants and medicine in their 
you know, in the in the woods and having trails to them where people who can go out and hi. <laughs> oh, this is hot. This is wonderful. I think traditionally and tribal wise, you have your children there with you and they're an important part of everything because they're going to be our future. They're going to be our leaders and um, it's important to have them. Um, we all live together in long houses or plank houses or community living and children were always with the adults and learning and I think it's very important. I, <laughs> oh, we're making all the love. Thank you. Hawk is very sweet. <laughs> Hi. Are you too shy or are you just going to hug me for a long time? And um, unlimited years. Thank you. Unlimited love. How do you say love in, in clown? How do you say it? Love. Yana with the uh, heart. That means heart. Uh, Yana was, yeah. Oh, you like plumachin as whale or orca. Yeah. <laughs> So teaching our children language is very important. Um, so a lot of things were lost, but we're slowly getting these things back. And um, I don't want to see us regress as a country. I don't want our children taken anymore. I don't want boarding schools. I don't want our religion, our freedoms to be taken anymore. So I think raising our children with a strength to stand up when they see injustice. I have many, most of my children are older in their 20s and almost 20. And my oldest, Tiger Lily, went to Standing Rock. I was very pregnant with Hawk. And I'm very happy and has done, you know, lots of protesting in the community. and. I'm really happy that I'm raising wonderful children who will stand up for injustice and stand up for other people's rights and their own rights. And we all have to do that. It's our responsibility. And if you don't have children, um, other people's children, help out, you know, be a part of your community. Hey, do you want to talk? You just agree? Yeah, you just agree. Oh, he's very hot and sweaty. Is it really hot out today? <laughs> I really am so happy to have him. Do you like watermelon? I know, I just wonder if all people like watermelon. I'm not sure if watermelon were from here in Washington State. I don't think so. <laughs> I know that you love watermelon though. Um, everybody likes apples, I'm sure. So, there is more watermelon if you'd like some. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so, what else did I want to say? You know, I'm a little distracted now, but it's good. He's definitely keeping my heart open and happy. I, I really wanted a son. We had all daughters, and we had a set of twins before him. And I was turning 40, and I was like, please, to my husband. <laughs> he says, no, I don't know, we're, we're, our children are all getting older. And I bet. I got a son, and I'm happy. He's wonderful. I had lost my grandfather and some uncles, and I was feeling really sad. And there's a lot of women in our family, which is wonderful. My mom's one of 13, nine girls, four boys. And... Um, it's really hard losing, losing them. I have one uncle left, and we're a very close family. So I'm glad there's another male in our, our family. I'm very happy. And he's a wonderful child. And a lot of times we'll pr pray for peace when he says his prayers. Um, you know, so, yeah. Um, that's what I'm going for in life, kind of trying to change my community Having wonderful open children, um, I've gone to speak at uh, a school and tried to talk to them about teaching um, indigenous history, local indigenous history. Um, 
and that was really nice. It was the kindergarten classes in Chimacum, and they were wonderful kids. Really excited to learn about cedar. I taught about cedar and the importance of cedar that day, but um, just trying to get curriculum about local indigenous people in schools is very important as well, because we need to know history. And I don't think the history is really told from an indigenous perspective. And I've been experiencing that in my community with like um, the historical society, you know, when you go to the historical society, they have like no information really on the local indigenous people, which is really, like, you're a historical society and there's two sides to this history around here. And you should really be learning more, um, documenting more. Um, it's important. Um, we can't hide everything. It will come to light and it's better to just get it over with, talk about it, see what we could do with where, you know. I don't hold anybody currently living responsible for what their ancestors did to my ancestors. But we're here. Okay, we're here. What can we do now? I'm not okay with the current situation of indigenous people in America. I'm not. You don't get to take all the land and kill my people and hurt us and use us. You know, it's been, what, 100 and, hasn't even been 200 years here. This is my great-grandparents. Can we have space? I want to see space for indigenous people off reservation in our traditional territories. I would love this all over the, everywhere. Indigenous people who were removed from their beautiful area to a different reservation or space. Give us space. Give us off-reservation space. Give us traditional spaces. Um, make things more accessible. Uh, um, you know, not just equality, equity. Um, things are not equal. We know that. Um, we need to make changes. We need to be accountable for that and what changes we can make to make things somewhat right. Uh, you know, I know not everything's going to be 50-50 right away, but I'm going to advocate for more land for indigenous people. And I think a lot of people don't know that most reservation or tribal land is held in federal trust. That is not a sovereign nation. If your land is still held by the government and you can't use it in a sovereign way, I don't want to ask permission, you know, I don't. I, if I'm not hurting the land and I'm taking care of the land, leave me alone, you know. I didn't ask for your government and your control. I'm going to do good things and be good and just let me be. <laughs> That's what I'd like to see for, for my people anyways. Um, life goals, I guess. Um, and I want that for my children. Um, and I don't want to see things change. The um, Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, was almost overturned. And I don't ever want, just the thought of that happening in this day is sickening and hurts my soul. Um, my dad and some siblings were taken and, from their mother, their family, and given to a farm. Um, this is my father. This is not far removed in history. This is my father I'm talking about. And it's recorded. I've been working with our historical society trying to convince them to have an um, indigenous whole section. Um, and they, have, they found some papers on that. And that's really hard to read that one, the way one, the doctor was talking about my grandmother. He had different hats. He wasn't just a doctor. He had different titles and community in early um, poor towns in history. And she started going somewhere else, and he had confronted her, and this is written down. Um, and he said, why are you seeing a different doctor? You're no longer coming here. And she said, well, you keep taking my babies. And he doesn't. This other doctor is not taking my children. You know, um, Assimilation. Um, my great great uncles went to boarding school and just didn't talk about it. Um, 
my mom's cousin talks about her dad. He just, he never spoke about residential school. And, you know, I understand why. If, you're, if they're taking your babies and you've been through trauma, do you want to stir the pot? Probably not, because you're afraid for your children. And I'm at this point in my life where I don't care. Um, do it. Maybe, yeah, do it, right? Um, I think that's good that we've come this far along in, here in America where we can have these conversations and I can say, sit as an indigenous person and say, no more. How dare you even try to overturn the Iqbal laws? How dare you? No, don't, don't take our babies. Don't take our sacred spaces. Don't sell our sacred sites. Don't do that. That's awful. Um, there's so many horrible things. And we, we need to maybe evolve a little faster or, um, yeah. Give me the thumbs up. You want to hold my hand? Yeah, I love you. So those are a few important things uh, for me, just experiencing with my family. Um, and loss of language. My mom remembers my mom's mother passed away when she was young. She was 15. Um, she remembers her singing and speaking, but only remembers a few words. And um, so the loss of language in tribes almost everywhere was, is really a big thing that many tribes right now are trying to relearn our language and reteach our languages to our children and people. And, you know, it's illegal for, um, it was illegal for not just language, but all of our spiritual practices. Um, it's really sad that a lot of that was lost. It, it's painful to me. Um, but if I can learn what I can and teach my children, may they carry that to their children and it not be lost. And that's very important on so many different levels. Um, and all over the planet, you know, I'm sure it's not just happening here. Many tribal people all over the world are being displaced, are being harmed, are, are losing these things. And we need to find a way to advocate the, for them through more than just words. I wish I could come up with some plan or just pray that it would end. Or just, sometimes I just envision myself uh, having just this huge voice of like the God voice and just screaming it out and that they hear it in all of their minds, all of these hateful, worrying, bombing, bad people in the world to just stop. The God inside of me that's inside of all of you needs to hear that that is not okay. That we don't kill each other. We don't kill babies. You cannot build a holy land on the blood of children of other people. It will never, yeah. it will never be sacred. That's not sacred land. God would not want you to do that. God is love. Your own God you speak of is love. And um, I wish they knew that. That's really, I wish I had that voice. I don't know. I think through prayer, if enough people prayed, maybe they would start to feel it. But yeah. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm a very emotional person. And I'm a mother. And I, I feel the pain of mothers everywhere. And not being able to feel like I can stop it is a really hard thing to to know what's happening and not having a way to make it stop. And I'm sure everybody's feeling that way here. Um, what do we do? You know, this is a little bit letting our community know that this is not okay. Letting our government know that this is not okay. This is not a country we want to be. This is not my America. Well, it's not my America, but this is not our indigenous country. This is not what we want as an indigenous people to see other people be murdered over land, you know? And I feel that's just a land grab, it's another land grab. Um, Gaza. Yeah, in Gaza. So it's just more of the same thing everywhere. 
It's terrible. When will we learn? You know? The rich are never sated. They just want more and more and more. More land, more money on the blood and the sweat and the pain and the loss and the children of other people. And that needs to end. So, yeah. We need to end that by teaching our children to be good and to change their mindset. Help them achieve a good mindset so when they go into the world, they're not going for money, they're not going for, you know, warlike mentality or even us and them. And uh, that's a hard thing to teach. It's not a hard thing to teach. You live it and you show it and then your children will know. But if you don't have children, you know, have children, and I know a lot of people who are like, well, this world is such a terrible place. I don't want to have children. I don't want to bring them into this. I say, no. If you're not having children and teaching them to be good beings, you have to trust that they or are, are, their children will learn somehow. If they're not teaching their children, who is the, who does this land upon, you know? I feel the duty to have children, to raise little warriors, little peace warriors, and good children and good beings. That's a responsibility to my, to me, to my ancestors. Keep my ancestors alive through my blood and my children. And yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm hoping other people will do. It's very important. It starts with our youth. You know, it's, I think it's easy for them to understand wonderful things and bad things, so it's a lot of it is what they're taught, but I think it's a little harder to change an adult's view when they've gone with a certain mindset their whole life. It's hard to persuade them that what they're thinking is wrong or that war is wrong or, or murder is wrong when they feel they're doing it justified by religion or whatever reason somebody would think that that's okay. It's hard to reason with somebody who's okay with things like that happening. So I don't quite understand to do that, but <laughs> oh, I love you. So I think that's about all I wanted to say. Um, maybe just teaching your children, go to your grandchildren, go to your community, community talks learning what plants are good in your environment um, for food. Um, just, you know, and doing that everywhere. I really hope that people in other countries are really understanding of what, <laughs> what will save them in times of need and what medicine they have around them. Yeah. So I think that's it. If anybody would like to ask any questions, um, yeah, well, thank, you. thank you very much for um, that information and, and thoughts on trying to have a more peaceful world for all of us. My question is, I, well, I would like if you could expand a little bit more on the longhouse, like will people be living there on the land, um, will it be open to the public, you know, what, what do you envision going on at the longhouse? Sorry, I'm a little sweaty. <laughs> So, um, with the land back that we purchased, we're building a longhouse, and the longhouse will be open to the public. It's kind of a learning cultural center. Um, I've been learning and doing uh, weaving, carving, um, many different things, and um, I would love to have not just local indigenous people come and learn their culture, learn how to do these things, learn how to harvest, learn how to weave, learn how to carve, do language classes, offer many different classes and have different teachers come in. And um, I would love to live in the longhouse for parts of the year. Um, I'm doing a very traditional style. It's gonna be dirt floor, um, fire pit in the middle, um, like cedar benching on the side. Um, but, uh, and with a traditional food gardens and a smokehouse, we're building a smokehouse for salmon fishing and just smoking whatever, oysters, clams, 
um, fish, uh, cheese. When I grew up, when I was a kid, we um, we got government cheese blocks, the big blocks of orange cheese. <laughs> and um, my parents would smoke them with a the salmon. So we always had smoked cheese, and it's really good. So I'm going to be smoking all kinds of things. And um, so it would be open for tribal use, and also to have um, people come in and learn more about the indigenous people in your community. So we would have um, open days and classes where people could come in and experience what a longhouse was. I would like to do a yearly like canvas bake and um, have like a big feast and with you know, smoked foods and traditional foods and invite people to come in and experience um, that and so there's there's so many different things. Oh, I don't want any chocolate. Thank you. They're gonna melt. Can you bring them back to the kitchen? Hawk really likes chocolate. Everybody likes chocolate. Chocolate. Um, so yeah, the longhouse is. We think we have enough cedar right now to start building. Um, we purchased plans from a company who has been doing many longhouses plan, uh, plans for longhouses all over British Columbia and just all over the place, and they're getting pretty good at it. Um, so this is in quick scene on Daybop, and it would have been Daybop, and uh, there was a village site and a longhouse in Daybop Bay. Um, one of my great Great grandmother's was Skokomish, and she lived in Quilcene. And there's a building named after her in Quilcene. But when her husband died, they took the land away from her, not only because she was a woman, but she was indigenous. And I find it funny that now there's a building named after her after all that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, thank you. You took all of her land, and her children went to residential school, and she had to go follow them go back and up on the reservation until she married another white man and came back to they couldn't get rid of her. Um, so Paul seems very... I'm, I'm, I am sad. I'm, I'll be okay, though. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah? I'd like to ask, in the restoration that you foresee, in the restoration of uh, culture that you foresee, uh, will it be 100% uh, um, as you knew it or heard about from your elders? Or are you willing to make some very necessary adjustments uh, in terms of learning um, to at least make a way within the greater nation's culture? Ooh, good one. I mean, so, when you have strong science of materials in your schools, would, would you have learning of other languages, national languages, in your school? No, I, not, not maybe in the future, but right now it's going to be indigenous languages, local indigenous languages for the people in our community. Um, we, we're doing revitalization for our people. Um, probably not teaching other races or other things because that's on those people to support their own cultures and teach those languages. I don't feel comfortable teaching other languages that aren't indigenous to my, my family. Or... Well, my family immigrated from Europe yep. generations ago, and I ended up in school learning ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, yeah. to make it in society, uh, yeah. in Latin and Greek, and that's spoken. So there are these, there are these accommodations. Yeah, that is pretty cool. I would love that. Um, my neighbor and good friend um, is, is learning Gaelic in different languages, and I think that would be wonderful. Um, my brain is having a hard enough time speaking two other languages to pick up any more at the time, but yeah. Mona? I was just wondering if you could 
tell us some other uh, native plants that uh, are edible besides the camas roots? Oh, probably basic ones that are easy to find around would be just like the regular nettles, camas. Um, I got a couple of berries. Oh, lots of berries. Yeah, don't tell them about the berries. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm on the spot. My favorite are red huckleberries. Those are my favorite. Um, right now, well, for the past, salal, yeah. For over a year, uh, there's different kinds of huckleberries. My favorite are red, but yeah, there's uh, there's different kinds of huckleberries. We've been battling blackberries on our land for a year now. If anybody went to work parties, they can attest to the amazing amount of blackberries that grew over everything. It was like native acres. Native, native trading blackberries. <laughs> Those are Himalayan blackberries. Yeah, there are different kinds of blackberries here. There are native blackberries as well. Yeah, they are. There's a question over here too. Yes. Hi, it was more of a comment. I, I just want you to know that I was very, it was very noticeable how much empathy you have with not just the mothers in Gaza, but all the people in Gaza. And I can realize by hearing you speak that, you know, what we're all witnessing is that microcosm there of the colonialist, colonialist slaughter that took place in this country. And I think that indigenous people are in a unique position to empathize with them because they literally know exactly what these people are going through. And I just wanted to say that I was always, I've always been very impressed um, when I, when, when, upon reading that during the, the great Irish famine in Ireland, uh, it was the Choctaw Nation, when they heard about this, they gathered, I'm sure everybody here knows that, they, they took up a collection and they sent money to the, to the starving people who, of, of Ireland. And I think there's even a memorial to them somewhere in Ireland, a beautiful sculpture somewhere. But um, I guess it was, at, at that time, it was a lot of money that they were able to collect to send there. But uh, it's, it's just very striking to me that as we sit here today talking about what your people went through, another people is undergoing the same tragedy. They really are. It's, I definitely feel that, the similarities and the occupation. Palestine has been occupied for a long period of time. It has been really hard for them. I still feel like people don't understand that a lot of indigenous feel like people feel like we're occupied. I don't know if you understand that, but that's what it feels like to me. And um, it doesn't feel great. You know, we're here. Um, we no longer have our ways, our language, our land, and we can't. Well, there's nothing we can really do about it. And the fear of like losing your children or having them taken to be assimilated or boarding schools or just being killed or there, there's always that fear. Yeah. You know, there's not many indigenous people left at all on this continent. Um, so yeah, I definitely feel feel for them, and I have for a while now, and it's really hard to see it see it happening, and nothing's being done again, you know. I I just want to honor um, what you are doing to establish uh, your native ways and your decision-making about how you're going to do it, educate your children. And, uh, it, and it's pretty hard to like push away all this, the, the colonialist attitudes that come at you is, oh, you ought to be doing this or you ought to be doing that. That you are going forward with your vision and your native, and, and the native ways, we all need to learn more about the native ways in this area. And, and your people know so much more about them than we do. Um, and so I, 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 and I live 
not too far from where you are. Oh, I wonderful. look forward to learning from, more from you. Yes. Thank you. Message me and come over and see what we have going on. We, it's only been one year and the land really needed extensive cleanup. There were old mobile homes and sheds and outbuildings. Hawk, oh yes, Hawk, would you like to say something? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I would love it if you'd come to, to see it. Oh, Hawk would like a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. So what would you like to say? How do you feel as a child? You can say what you feel from your heart. How do you feel as a child? Do you want to see your people be free and other children be free and unharmed? I yes. Know you do. We have this talk. And I never want to see bad things happen to children and women. And people need to understand, they're like, they voted in Hamas. I'm like, Hamas or whatever. They, you know, they didn't. It was like very small percentage voted them in. And so you're killing women and children. The majority of the people are women and children. And there's no justification for that at all. Zero. Elders, women and children. Probably already killed off the men, and that's why it's mostly women and children. And no justification ever. Um, but I'll continue to fight for what I believe is right and for my people and for my children because I'm not doing it for me, I'm doing it for my children and for what my ancestors had to go through. Um, our village was um, our last village site because we had a couple massacres pre-colonization um, by other local tribes. And... Um, in the mid-1800s, there were 38 longhouses in Port Townsend, and the majority of them were still Chimicum and then some Clallam. But um, they would, for a long time, uh, say that we were extinct. We're not extinct. There just isn't many of us. I had to change Wikipedia. I literally went on and fought with Wikipedia online a couple times um, to change that. You don't get to say we're not here, take our land. It's erasure. It's erasure. Um, so you don't have, you can freely live in the town where you burned our village down and sent us to a tribe that we were a post, a post tribe. And for those indigenous people who refused to leave, they went to different areas in town or the outskirts of town. Um, my family didn't leave. You're probably just as stubborn as I, I am. That's probably where I get it from. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. You're stuck with us. So then they made it illegal for us to rebuild after they burned down our village. In 1911, they made a law in Port Townsend making it illegal for us to rebuild our longhouses. So what can you do for an indigenous person living in your, living in your homeland? And you can't build. You know, it's just keeping... Another way to keep us down or get rid of us. And um, I forgot where I was going. But I want longhouses back. I'm, I'm taking that back. I'm taking these things you took from my grandmother back. You took from my father back. I'm not, I'm not settling for less. And I would like to see more changes in a wider scope of freedoms for indigenous people. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. I have a really vague question. I don't know if I really have, well, I'll just say I have some thoughts and a vague question, yeah. So I, I mean, you know this already, I have a child who's Lakota and his dad's not involved with raising him and I'm thinking about all this stuff too, like, uh, how to raise a child that's aware of its indigenous heritage and all the violence that led to the circumstance where his dad could be involved. And um, also just all the violence in the world and how to be 
a nonviolent person. And uh, anyway, he's almost five. So, what are your thoughts or Hawk's thoughts about? Um, um, yeah, what? To, I don't know. What to do with Hokala? I would suggest including Hokala in any indigenous activities you can that are in your community. Um, we do have a good um, BIPOC community, um, family gatherings in Jefferson County where um, children can be around other children that are like them. And there's a lot of Native families there and Native events you can go to as well, but it gets children out in the community with other indigenous or other people like them. Um, because a lot of times, if you don't live on a reservation or in your area, you don't get to be around it. What are your thoughts, Hawk? Do you think he should be around other children like him? Okay, say something. The people that stole our land is meanies. They're meanies, yeah. The people who stole our land are meanies. They are. <laughs> so I would suggest, even if it's not their tribe, but including them in other... I know that Jamestown has a great children's program, and they take other children from other tribes, like all over, not just um, Washington State tribes. And um, they have... Summer, pro it's free. It's free summer programs, and children get to do all sorts of activities. So maybe if you're not close to Jamestown, maybe Port Gamble has the same thing, and that's really fun. And they do a lot of, a lot of events. What? Even canoe journey for children. Yeah. <laughs> so Hokal might really like that. So other tribes here are really good about children, and it doesn't just have to be that. A, a question too, it, it seems like the, the big issue often in tribal politics are the, are the casinos, and that seems to be the big money source, and I, I feel kind of sad about that. That's the only, the big thing for all indigenous people is having casinos. Shouldn't there be something better than casinos? That, that, what are you trying to do about that? I know that all tribes don't have casinos. Um, I don't know. Um, I like to go to bingo, but I'm not a big tribe of a big fan of casinos. Um, I'm not sure. I I know that not all tribes have casinos. I know that um, one. One thing, um, my husband's a Mainer, and my mom got a divorce and moved to Maine. Um, so I was living with my husband in Maine, and they wouldn't allow the Penobscot um, tribe to have a casino. They put all the natives there on, on an island called Indian Island in Old Town, Maine. And they had wanted a casino, and they asked the state and the um, city, they wouldn't allow them. And then like a year later, the state did their own casino. It's not even a native casino, it's just a casino. So, um, that was really funny. Oh, you're not allowing, and first of all, if we're sovereign, why are we even asking you if we can open a casino? So I think there's this big illusion that we're sovereign or that the, the reservation land belongs to the indigenous people. It doesn't if it's in federal trust. Um, so, I'm not a fan of casinos, but I can see that it brings in revenue from the tribe, and personally, I don't care if they want to take white people's money at a casino, take it. Get that money. Get something back if you can. I really don't care. I don't like it, but it's not, you know. If that's what you're doing, that's what you're doing. And um, if that's where you want to go spend your money or lose your money, that's your boss. I don't really like slots. I never win. I do like bingo because I have fun with my aunties and what. Somebody has a question? Oh, hi. Thank you, Hawk. Hi. So, I'm from the Midwest, and I'm living here now, and I am enjoying this beautiful place, but I don't know that much about the plants or the cedars. Uh, I, I know, I read on your website that you're, you were focused, I think, on uh, camas and chocolate lilies and nettles. Yeah, nettles and um, uh, 
uh, yeah, different kinds of lilies and lamatium and different plants and berries, but um, I'm also learning things. Um, I didn't get to, my, like I said, my grandmother passed away when my mom was young, so, uh, and her mother passed away when she was young. So we have a lot of this um, learning that gets lost when you lose your mother over and over in history. You lose a lot of information. So I'm trying to relearn that information. And I really love cedar so much. And I brought some cedar to, for people to do, um, make some smudge sticks or to bring home with them. And we brought some twine to do, make some smudge if people are interested. But cedar is used for so many different things. It's really amazing, or we would call it safe pus. It's, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. <laughs> What's it used for? What are some examples? So, um, if you use the oil, it's really, it's almost like tea tree oil. It's really uh, antibacterial, antifungal, very strong, so be aware. It's really, it's like tea tree times 10 or something. It's very strong. Um, we used it for carving paddles, rattles, masks, houses. Um, we use the bark for weaving, for our clothing, for our beds, for our mats, for our walls. For I know, I know. I'm going to finish this question and then we'll go to the next question. Um, so there's so many different uses for cedar in our culture, and cedar is very important, very important to it. Um, all the tribes around here, not anyone's set tribe. We all really loved and used cedar, had a very close relationship with a cedar tree because we needed it for, um, it was really good to build with, to keep bugs out and, yeah, yeah. I have good. one kind of silly comment and I have a serious question. Um, my sisters and I go to the casino once in a while and we call it reparations. Nice! We call it for standing up. We're just saying lose. <laughs> and we always do. I like that. That's wonderful. <laughs> and, and the that other is. question is, um, can you comment a little bit about why the federal government doesn't recognize your tribe? Um, I know that there's many steps you have to go through to become federally recognized, and there, it's really hard, and there's probably 300 of us. I don't know, there's not very many of us. And then you come into all these different things like blood quantum. Um, there's so many different hoops to jump through. So um, that's definitely, um, it makes it harder. And then, you know, there's big tribes like the Duwamish who aren't recognized, you know. Seattle, Duwamish, they're not federally recognized. There's many, uh, is it Snohomish? There's lots of tribes that aren't federally recognized. And, you know, I don't need the federal government to tell me I'm indigenous. I'm a mixed tribal person. Both of my parents were a couple different tribes and my grandparents and so on. It was very common for tribes to find their partners in another tribe, so you're not all having kids with your relatives. And um, I'm a mixed tribal person, so I'm enrolled at Quinault, but I'm, I'm sharing that I'm multi-tribal because I value all of my ancestors, all they went through. Um, and I want to break that stigmatism of, or this, no, stereotype, like, you just this tribe, or, you know, there's a lot of this thing in, in local tribes where, like, you know, you can be multi-tribal, and it shouldn't, you sh they shouldn't break you down to blood quantum of each tribe and separate, because they don't take blood quantum from another tribe. So if you're, like, half, you know, but you're only so much of one tribe, you can't be enrolled there because you, have, you can't have, they don't combine blood quantum. It's separate, and I don't think that we should have any government say in anything that tribes do. I don't. I don't need a card to say that I'm indigenous. I'm not white enough to be white. 
what am I? You know, and I don't need permission. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not asking permission, I'm just gonna do it. And then if I get in trouble, I'm hoping I have enough support for my community to say, she can live in a longhouse. So that was a thing with our, our county was, um, we don't have, uh, there's no way for building plans for a longhouse or to it to be accepted by county code. I don't give a rat's patootie. I'm not asking your permission. You, so in, what was it, 2019, the Clallam, Jamestown had given a totem to Port Townsend, and at that ceremony, the town rescinded their law against indigenous people building longhouses again. And I'm like, it's no longer illegal. <laughs> what can I do about this now? So you say it's no longer illegal. You shouldn't have a problem with me building a longhouse on private land and living in it. Um, you know, we've, we've jumped through your hoops. We've been pushed in little patches of land here and there. And I know a lot of tribes, I really appreciate Jamestown's effort in buying back land. You know what they do with your casino money? They're buying back land, dude. Lots of land. Not just, I mean, so you say, oh, that tribe's got all this wonderful waterfront land. It wasn't given to them by the government. They had to buy that land, you know? And you need to under understand that. Uh, I'm going to continue. I'm going to try to buy back land, and I want to enact my rights as an indigenous woman to live in a longhouse and you know, be me. Let me be me. Come see the beautiful gardens in the longhouse, but I'm not asking permission anymore. <laughs> I'm doing it. And when I start doing something wrong, then you can come in and say, hey, straighten me out, but I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm just going to be. <laughs> I was thinking that a Seattle area famous work on the issue of homelessness and many people without housing. I thought, well, maybe a longhouse might be a solution for some of these people. Because one of the things people lack there is communal living. Yeah. You can't survive just by yourself in some little apartment sometimes. You end up in this, it doesn't work, you see. So, like, we, we have a tiny house village now, but it's not really quite a long house. It's as a large community, but not as much as you might have there. Um, another thought I have is some of us are older and have more touches in any conditions. Like, I do a lot of hiking, and for many years I used a hiking pole. Guess what it was made of? Devil's Club. Yes, but I by, love Devil's Club. By, by, by an indigenous person, in fact. Yeah, and it turned out to have a very lightweight, very flexible, the perfect thing. And there are all of these gems that people don't even realize are there. <laughs> and I hope you can publicize some of those gems. I do, I like Devil's Club. Um, I make a salve out of Devil's Club and um, <laughs> cottonwood but, uh, buds, and it really helps me. Um, sore. My hands are really sore from carving or weaving or beadwork. I do beadwork and paint and do many things and shop clams for years. My grandparent, my grandpa and my aunties owned clam shop. My aunts owned clam shops. So my right hand gets sore. And um, learning what plants to make salves with really helps or medicine with and Devil's Club is a good help. My aunt, one of my aunts will take seeing nettles for her arthritis and just hit, her, hit herself with it in the areas and uh, yeah, that's pretty I could never do that but yeah, I guess it works <laughs> oh, in the back, yeah hi um, hi um. Thank you for saying your, your words. I really honor oh, thank you. your words. Um, I've been thinking about land back and, and uh, reparations and money back for a long time, several years now, actually. And so just in a very lucky position that when the um, COVID relief checks came, I was able to donate those to an awful nation. And then I had important to help my friend out, who was not Japanese. And uh, so that felt good. And then. I'm just recently, I don't know if anybody, I don't, I don't know if this works in other communities, but 
when you go to city council or county commissioners meetings for the most part, when they have the open time when you can speak your three minutes or your five minutes public comments, it can be about anything. And so we get the chance to, which I've been taking on this a little bit, we have a county commissioner in Lewis County who said, who asked the one of the tribes bought some land and they want to open a YMCA in partnership with the The county commissioner asked the tribal member, um, will this be managed by tribal members or normal citizens? Oh. <laughs> and so I was did this weird thing. I don't speak in public generally. This well, is, I was nonverbal for a while with kids. It was really unusual for me to speak in public. I'm becoming really comfortable with it. But that really prompted me to do it. And I I realized I could go and say this to the county commissioner, Sean Swope. I said, well, you you can't say that. You, that's wrong. You can't do that. Yeah. And so I'm just having this idea that you're speaking today. One of the things I can begin to talk about is when county has extra land that's not being managed, the city has a park that's not being built on or extra land, we as Citizens, as community members, anybody can go to those meetings and ask them to begin to consider to give that land in trust or whatever to, to, to Native uh, people. Any of us can do that. So whether we're in whatever your city is or whatever your county is, those common moments are free to speak about whatever you want to talk about. So thank you. Thank you for, for advocating for, for us. Here. I've done the same thing at City Council in Port Townsend and said, you know, this land on the waterfront, there were many natives that lived here and it's been sitting here since you all came. Can we use this? And they're like, oh, well, this, that, you know. Um, the land is still sitting there vacant. It could be indigenous use. Um, and to have allies who would go to City Council and say, hey, you know, this land is vacant. You could have it be an indigenous space. Nothing has been there since you removed us. Why is it still just sitting there, but we're not allowed to use it? Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I was noticing, you know, uh, how you interact with your son. And, uh, you know, I heard of the, uh, Natives treat their children differently. You know, they kind of let them run wild and just be children. And uh, I wonder if you actually are aware, you know, of how that that's different than how white people generally raise their kids. Yeah, I've had people say something for, to me before, and I'm like, my kid is well behaved. To me, this is well behaved. He's interacting with me and feels freely enough in the love and relationship we have that he can come around me and talk around me. It's not sit and be quiet, not be heard, not be a part of the conversation. How would you not want your kid to be a part of the conversation? We're so removed. A lot of times, like, I had people who wanted me to just let them, let my children cry themselves to sleep. Not, not co-sleep with your children. Um, and I think that we create this disconnect from our babies, Amer like people do, uh, or white people, just not, let's just put them in the crib, give them a bottle, not breastfeed. I breastfed all of my children. Um, for a long time, for like two years each, hot longer. Um, and they always slept with me and I allow them the freedom to be who they are. And he's not hurting anybody by being a part of my conversation. And I think it's just so weird to just like, nuclear family and like, let's just give our kid a bottle and put them in a room all by themselves without the comfort and love of their mother. Um, you know, it's, it's awful. Circumcision it should not hurt babies. They did tests. They're never the same brain. Their brain waves are not the same ever again. It, it's, it does something. Um, don't hurt your babies. Breastfeed if you can. Hold them close. Let them sleep with you. Let them be a part of 
your community, and guess what? They're learning. They're, they're absorbing everything you do, and if they're just a, sitting over in the corner and they can't talk and they can't be valued in the conversation, it's really, it's really sad to me. Um, so I always just let my kids be kids. You know, and I don't think they need medication or ADHD drugs. I think they just want to be apart and hang out. And like when you're playing music, Hop wants to play music and dance and sing and be a part of everything. They're just as smart as we are. They're the same as us. They're only smaller. And guess what? They're absorbing a lot. <laughs> yeah. I do like songs. You do like songs, yeah. So, um, I think it, it's normal for indigenous people to keep their children around them and allow them to use knives and help and do things in the kitchen. He likes cutting vegetables. I do give him a dull knife. Um, I do allow him to put wood in the fire if we have a fire going and things. If we teach them things young and include them in how to do things, they know how and they're not going to get hurt. I know somebody was always scared that I would let my kids just wander around or climb on things or do things. Like, they know what they're doing. They, you know, they, they got this. They've been doing it a long time. They're, yeah, I trust their judgment. I trust my children. <laughs> Thank you, Hawk. My um, son-in-law is Maka and Swahomish. So I have a 12-year-old granddaughter who, and I only have one granddaughter, so you know, all grandchildren are wonderful, but especially if you just have one. But one of the things that he has taught her that um, impresses me so much is the respect and connection with elders. And um, I mean, I don't have grandchildren without the, having that training, but it, even though I'm not indigenous, he has her say, go help Mimi, um, you know, go give Mimi a goodbye hug, and, um, and then modeling the um, older people need help, so, um, and respect, and, you know, we need to listen to her stories, and not just to listen because you have to listen, valuing those family stories. So um, I think that's a big part of indigenous tradition too. And then I we keep looking, you know, I since he's the indigenous parent, um, we often leave it to him to help her involved in uh, activities with the the. McCall and so, um, but um, but there are some wonderful things that want. We live in Olympia, and uh, she's interested in theater, theater and acting. So she's been nice. working with the uh, intertribal film festival. Oh, nice! Do things like that, and it's uh, it's wonderful to find that there are other things. Um, out there for for the indigenous youth that um, speak to their particular interests. Mm -hmm. There's also um, Olympia just had a Olympia Reads um, um, inaugural meeting, and the speaker was Christine Day, who writes um, is a Upper Skagit native and um, writes books for 8 to 12 year olds and she came and spoke to the the people that, that the children um, and then to all the community in the evening last week and was really quite wonderful and I think really made things more meaningful to all the children um, indigenous and, and non in terms of um, she writes about children, but children and their issues because of their, some of them because of their indigenous um, backgrounds and some different. So, um, and I'm always looking for more ideas of things to suggest to Twana because of, 
you know, I can no longer tell her what to do, but, uh, but I can give her ideas. Oh, nice. I love that the tri tri a lot of tribes have just wonderful children's programs, and they do, and it's a cultural thing. It, even at events, you know, elders first. Respect our elders, that's very, very big teaching. Um, we love our elders, and I'm so glad that all the tribes really invest in their children in all different children's programs. Like they learn how to make things, do things. They learn language, song, dance. Um, they participate in canoe journey. They, they are a very important part of the community, just as elders are. Yes, Hop. <laughs> do you like your elders? Go ahead, speak. Too nervous. <laughs> So I've realized I'm also eight years old right now. And Hawk and I plan, we made a plan, we want to invite you all to a funny face contest. Yeah. Oh, nice. Say I you want to be the judges. Who wants to be a judge of the funny face contest? Say I. Say I. <laughs> Anybody want to be a judge? I wish he wants to be a Jonathan? Yes. Jonathan? I think Jonathan's winning the funny face contest right now. I think he won. He's not even a judge. He won. How, where's your funny face, Hawk? And laughter is very good. Hawk is very good at laughter. He makes me very happy and he's very funny. All right. Yeah. What's your Donald Duck? You've been liking Donald Duck. When Donald Duck is all riled up. <laughs> all right. Well, children are great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Oh, thank you all. This was really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. So conversations, have them in your community. It also helps. You helps with racism. So if you don't understand or have good relationships in community, have everybody get together and sit and have conversations like this with different races. And you, it will really stop racism because once you get to know people and you'll see that we're all the same and we all want good things and who doesn't like that? So, yeah. <laughs>